Today I'm speaking with Forrest Clay. Clay, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And you want to go uh, be called Clay, is that correct? Correct, yeah. Awesome. And uh, I just wanted to give everyone a brief bio for uh, Clay. Clay lives in northern Ohio, and mm -hmm. he is an artist. You are, you, I can even see your piano back there, and I saw your guitar. How many instruments do you play, by the way? Just piano and guitar. Okay. And you're obviously, yeah. obviously a vocalist as well. Mm -hmm. And just a brief bio, you gave, uh, excuse me, you grew up in an independent, fundamental Baptist household, mm -hmm. and your grandfather was even a traveling evangelist, you mentioned, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. And your dad was the principal of a Christian school, which you attended. And then after high school, you were in a band called The Undeserving which I want to hear about in a little bit. And then mm -hmm. you, you all had a mainstream record deal with Warner Brothers, which is really cool. Uh, I'd love to hear some details on that. Mm -hmm. And you were a part-time worship leader at a large evangelical church. And then sometime around 2012, you started really studying creation theology, which was the beginning of your deconstruction process about the Bible. Mm -hmm. That process went on for a few years. And then you left church in 2015, continuing your spiritual journey until now. We want to get into where you're at with that at this point. And then lastly, uh, you're married, dad of three mm -hmm. boys. Mm -hmm. And you do have an upcoming EP, an extended play coming up uh, that is basically a letter to, an America, to the American church. So yep. um, we're going to go into some of those details here in a few minutes, but could you tell us anything else about yourself uh, in terms of a bio that, uh, any hobbies or things you like to do? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. I, see, I, my, I'm married, been married 14 years. We got married at 21, somehow survived purity culture. And, um, you know, I would think we're happily married now. And uh, my boys are uh, nine, seven, and one. And uh, there will be no more. And uh, <laughs> we, uh, like I said, we live kind of out in the country near Sandusky, Ohio, um, in a little town. So about 20 minutes from Cedar Point and the lake and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. So it's nice. A, nice, a nice area, except that, in the winter. What's that lake called? Lake Erie. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. where are you at? I didn't ask where you were at. I'm down in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, okay, sweet. Yeah, so not too too close. Although I did I did grow up in Philadelphia, so uh, I was a little bit closer. And I actually used to we used to go to a Baptist camp in Ohio called O Penn, hmm. uh, conservative Baptist camp. That was a uh, that's a story for another day, but that was an interesting event. Um, <laughs> so I did want to uh, ask. Uh, we're we're gonna this one's gonna be a little bit shorter than my usual interviews, but I did want to ask for for a little bit more of your um, spiritual mm -hmm. background. You know what you grew up hearing about. Um, what you were taught as a kid, and then uh, if time allows, we'd love to uh, hear you play whatever is uh, on your mind in terms of a song. Absolutely. So, um, like I said, I grew up um, a independent fundamental Baptist household. Um, grew up in Cincinnati, and um, my I wouldn't say my parents were had bought into it as much as that's where they were employed. And so, yeah, like my first movie in a movie theater was Jurassic Park 2 when I was <laughs> like 13 years old or something. And uh, so that was just kind of what we, um, that was just, you know, the culture that we lived in. And we had uh, things, you know, just a lot of rules. And if you're familiar with that denomination, just like, even throughout high school, going to like a Christian, the, the Christian school that was attached to the church. Um, we went, I went to two different schools, but uh, same denomination. And yeah, like there were times where we would play other schools. Now this was not us, but like, for example, like our cheerleaders had to wear like long skirts or pants. And then there were times where we would go play at other schools against other schools and we would have to wear pants like in the games like they wouldn't allow boys to wear shorts right like that kind of thing and so um but like theologically it was very um you're pretty standard like conservative christian theology right you know with your grandfather being a traveling evangelist that must have been really interesting background did you hear some stories or were you ever at any of his events yeah well yeah so he Evangelist may not be the right word. He was probably more like what we call like a church planter. And so he would go, they would move somewhere. So like the, the longest my mom ever lived anywhere was three years, her whole like childhood. So they would move somewhere. He would start a church, find a pastor to take over for him and then move. And they, they lived all over the country. And so um, 
by the end of his life, he had settled down a little bit and kind of lived near us. Um, but yeah, that same kind of like Southern Baptist. And then my dad's side of the family, they were all based like in Indianapolis, but same denomination, but like Northern. And I, I actually think a little even more legalistic, um, hmm. not uh, different cultures, but same completely different cultures, but same denomination if that they're still baptist right all baptist but very different because yeah. one was like southern and one was northern and it was very uh an interesting dichotomy but for anyone yeah. that i mean a lot of people that watch my show probably would be aware of what baptists uh stand for and believe mm -hmm. but just for anyone that might be outside of that circle could you give us a brief rundown of what you remember is kind of the, yeah. the main tenets the the absolute um pillar of the theology is you know, we call penal substitutionary atonement theology, which is the um, idea that Jesus came and died to pay for our sins so we could go to heaven. And um, that's everything else surrounding that um, was kind of built as a... Uh, everything surrounding that idea was um about living in a way that like the they interpreted the bible as directing them to live and mm -hmm. so and obviously like uh, the churches i went to as a kid were like king james only bible which that's a conversation you know that you could do a whole podcast about that kind of thing right yeah um and so yeah f wild and but that's what that's all i knew and it wasn't until after high school when i like started getting out of it like oh man this is like a whole another world out here <laughs> was so, your grandfather and parents king james only no my parents were never that way okay. um my grandfather was my grandfather was for sure um but my parents were never that way no i always used to get a kick out of it when um you'd see a church like maybe an older gentleman who usually with a deep commanding voice would get mm -hmm. up and, and do like a prayer and they would even though they wouldn't of course speak in king james english in normal conversation they would get into it and you know these and thou's would just come out you know uh, absolutely 100 times in this long prayer and it was i always i mean obviously at this point now that i'm deconverted it, mm -hmm. it means nothing to me but at the time i always thought does that like help you to be more spiritual to talk like that does it focus mm. you more on God? Is God more pleased with that? And it was interesting to go into, I went to Bob Jones University for a year. Do you ever heard of Bob Jones? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Very familiar. Okay. I didn't finish my time there, but I was, I had a lot of, as you would imagine, a lot of King James only people there that I was with and they, Bob Jones at that time, the school came out pretty clearly saying we're not King James only, which mm. really surprised me. I think it upset some people. And their Greek department even said, like, look, there's older manuscripts that are much better that would correct the King James, where the King James is mistaken. And I'm sure it ruffled feathers from to say it. And, and then, of course, Pensacola Christian College was much more like, no, we're, we're standing with the, the true word of God, the King James. But it was, it was more of a sidebar to my experience, but I could, I could see some people were really caught up in it. Yeah. And that's so wild to me. It's yeah. so wild to me. It's wild to me because this isn't hard information to get like you can go see the dead sea scrolls you know what i mean uh, um when i one of my favorite uh favorites is pete ends and he just did a whole thing about like the idea of an original copy and how it's just like there's no such thing as the original we don't have them we yeah. have like a scattered mess um, and that can teach us a whole lot of things about how it was put together. But like the idea of an original manuscript is just silly. Yeah. And, uh, and so, it was, yeah, it's just fascinating to me that, and that's still a thing. Um, my, I have an aunt and uncle, um, and a cousin who are still deeply entrenched in that world. Um, and yeah, actually on both sides of my family, I have multiple aunts, uncles, cousins that are all still in that denomination and um it's just yeah it's wild and just to go through a few more of their tenets um you mentioned penal substitutionary atonement the idea that um you're you're a sinner deserving punishment and that mm -hmm. 
that that is going to happen one way or the other. Either you're going to get it, or someone else is going to stand in your place. Yep. And that the the hope and the and the glory of the gospel is that you're going to be able to what I would now call scapegoating, but you're going to be able to transfer your sins, or, or God's going to effectively transfer them, you know, judicially to Christ, and you effectively get covered by His righteousness even while yes. you're still in your sins. And that that's right. a, the implication behind it is that that whole message is, isn't coming from just nowhere. It's coming from this Bible, which we would, you know, the, the Baptists and a lot of other denominations would say is, is from God. And mm-hmm. it is, in fact, inerrant. Like this, this is not a book of human philosophy that's kind of, we're kind of going to elevate it as if it's somewhat important. We're going to say this is from God, even though he spoke through men and, and a few women, that he, he was actually giving us his actual message, his, his true letter, so that we can say this is from God himself. Yes, in in the King's English. Yeah, in the King's English. <laughs> and what what would you say if, if someone had come up to you at that point in time and said, "Hey, I, I heard you go to church. Uh, I'm struggling. I really think I need to get right with God. How do I do it?" What would you have said to him back then? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, or if they said, "Hey, I, I, what if I die tonight? What? How do I get in heaven?" I, I would. I, I'm sure I would have given them some version of the Romans Road. Um, you know, what's interesting is I don't, I went through like a phase, uh, like an apologetics phase. And I think that was just my subconscious going, you really don't buy this. You got to cling on harder, you know? And, um, and like I said, that started in my bio, I started with creation theology and I thought, I think, I think I always felt so much and I still do find so much value in the teachings of Jesus without, um, I, I mean, I remember before my deconstruction, like wondering about the, the basic questions, everyone wants. like, what's the point of hell? Well, you know, like what's, um, all of those types of questions. I think had I, I think I still held on to some belief in hell because I was told to have a belief in hell. Whether or not I actually bought it, I really don't know. I, I it's a long time ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I no, know. Yes, it's a good point. Yeah, I I don't. And and then if you really start breaking down, what does it mean to believe in anything? Anyways, you could argue that the only people that actually believe in hell are the people like my cousins who still hold up signs on the street corners. Right? They're the ones that are actually they actually believe it. Yeah. So, um. Oh, so they do like real street preaching still. Oh yeah. The whole, I mean, it's in the dresses and the whole deal. It's wild. And I, yeah, I think, um, had someone told me that I would have probably guided them to like probably a pastor I trusted because I was pretty shy, but I think, um, even in my like circle of friends, I don't remember like we were just normal boys, you know, like we played, I, I was on the basketball team, like I said, and like, we just, I don't remember having like, these deep spiritual conversations. I mean, I remember church camps and like all of those normal, like processes of like, you know, this kind of artificial generation of a spiritual experience at camp. And um, like, and I remember it once I started leading worship and like figuring out how to make that happen. You know what I mean? Um, Figuring out that the better I performed, the more likely people were to like, have some sort of spiritual experience. And I I mean, that to me was information that I figured out before I even started kind of deconstructing. And so, I don't know, man, that's a good question because I don't know that I have a good answer other than I think I would have prodded them towards like someone who I thought was smarter than me. That's probably what I would have done. Yeah. I know what you mean. What you have said for yourself with going to the camps and having all this exposure from family and church to mm. to the preaching of the gospel that you had a time where you, that you recall where you actually did profess your faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I remember as a maybe five, five year old kid having kind of like that saying the sinner's prayer with my parents moment, you know, and I remember vividly throughout, um, my elementary school and junior high years praying it all the time out of fear of hell, you know, like every chapel service, you know, like, Oh, I don't know if I've, 
I don't know if I don't know if my salvation experience was good enough, you know, mm-hmm. and kind of that like terror and trauma of the idea of hell and making sure I was right with God at every moment in case my heart's just magically stopped beating. You know what I mean? So you would kind of re <clears throat> restate your faith in Christ to kind of like, almost like a recommitment to be sure it was for real. Yeah, absolutely. Is that more than once that you redid it? All the time. Really? All the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All the time. Every, like I said, every time we would have, I, I vividly remember it through like my later elementary school years, just like the thought of just being terrified of hell and wanting to make sure I wasn't going to go there for sure. Hmm. Do you recall ever dealing with the issue of knowing that certain people, either people you knew mm-hmm. or just, just random, you know, tribal people somewhere in the middle of the jungle that somebody was, was on their way to hell right now and that you had to deal with the fact that, you know, you might even have someone that you knew that had already passed that was right now burning in hell. Did that kind of concern you and the whole fairness issue? Like, is this fair that people without Christ might be burning in hell? Absolutely. Yeah. We, we always, I remember the, you know, the, um, people, uh, people, you know, the, like you said, people, uh, natives in a jungle somewhere that had never heard of Jesus. Like what, you know, people would argue about that was like a common, like apologetics argument. Right. And so I remember always, I always would think that God would lean on the side of mercy it, but I never was sure if it was, if there would be enough for me. Right. And so those times were, um, I don't remember when I kind of grew out of that, probably sometime in high school is when I really st- stopped worrying about my own salvation. And maybe because I got more involved in like church and leading worship and like that kind of thing. Like um, you saw the fruit of the spirit. So you knew you yeah, were good. I think so. And I, I think I saw enough kids around me that were like, you know, worse than I, you know, quote unquote, worse than I was. And I thought I, I'm doing better than somebody. Right. And so, and I think that was probably enough for me to like get over that fear. But um, hmm. I don't remember, or I remember it wasn't till um, whenever Rob Bell's Love Wins came out. I, I remember reading Love Wins at my when I was at the evangelical church, I led worship at, and th- it was kind of like the talk of the town. Cause like they had used all his, like the, the nouveau videos or whatever he did. And they had used all those in like the youth group. And like, he was this up and coming guy, yada, yada. And they were all just like, you know, this is heresy. And I remember reading it going like, he's not, I don't, I don't get why you saying what's wrong about this. Like, he's just asking a bunch of questions as what I it took from the book. <laughs> And I thought they were great questions, um, especially the bit about like, if we actually believed hell was real, we'd kill our children. Right. And there's a, gotta be a song in there somewhere. But um, I think that at that point I started to suspect that like, this is at least, at least more complex than I've been told at, at the very least, there's more to this story mm-hmm. than, than you're going to burn forever. If you don't say the sinner's prayer. Yeah. Well, we've been touching on the, the deconstruction process from the perimeter and I want to um, save, save the going over into it for, for a few more questions sake. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you first about purity culture. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned that before and the whole idea too is a good context for that. The whole idea of questioning your salvation over and over, which a lot of us did uh, just because, you know, the, the, the Bible talks about things like presumptuous sins and, you know, the, the, you get this sense like I need to f- ask God to forgive me for the sins I'm aware of, but also the sins I'm, I'm not aware of and that there's sins of omission and commission. And like, what about the stuff? I just, I just didn't do it. I didn't mm-hmm. really hurt somebody, but I-, I failed God in some way. And so you're always afraid that you're falling short. And even if you're coming from more of a Calvinistic perspective in the long run, either way, you still emotionally feel like if I don't see the fruit of the spirit, I might not be serious. And the Bible talks about, uh, making your salvation sure, like meaning, you know, living it out, you know, live out with uh, fear and trembling what God has done inside of you. And so if you don't see it because of a season of, of struggling with something, you, you do tend to question. And one of the areas that that comes up a lot in is 
both purity culture, but also um, mixed right in with it is, is more uh, modesty culture and shame culture. And especially for, I think, young, young men and women in, their, in you know, hitting puberty, you get to this point where you, you get tempted to, to doubt your salvation in part because the temptations are getting to, to think the wrong thing is getting stronger and stronger. And so, for example, you know, just to be <clears throat> kind of silly about it, but you might walk past, as a young 14-year-old boy, walk past a Victoria's Secret in the mall, and you're thinking your parents have told you, you know, don't look. And everything you says, I want to look, mm. or whatever it is, you know, a lot of uh, illustrations that we could use, but whatever it is, you feel like you should be ashamed of yourself. And you end up struggling. And even if you don't question your salvation, you certainly end up feeling like you're just definitely displeasing God. How did that go down for you in your, in yeah. your journey? That's a big one. Um, I think, so my wife and I, um, I could say we started like dating at 16, but we weren't allowed to like date, right? Till at least after high school. Um, were you chaperoned? No, we we were allowed to go out by ourselves after we graduated. Graduation was like the the milestone that made it okay, right? And so in my parents' defense, um, they're, you know, they had been in that culture their whole lives. It was all they knew. And, and I was their firstborn and they, they had no idea what they were doing. Right. <laughs> and so my, I, I was my young, I have three younger siblings and it was much easier for them. That's for sure. And so, um, but yeah, we, we grew up, um, in that culture where like sex was something, you know, for marriage only. And, um, like any sort of public displays of affection, especially like in high school was just like a huge no, no. And man, I remember like one of my best, my best friend in high school got caught making out with his girlfriend, like 10th grade, right. In the, in the freaking youth pastor's office when he wasn't in there. And I thought it was the funniest and they made him like get up in front of the whole school and apologize. Not her which was interesting, but him and, uh, apologize. And it was, I thought hysterically funny and, but I'm yeah, sure we, he was horrified. <laughs> oh man. I, it's crazy. I, yeah. It's, that's funny. He, that's a guy who ended up eloping with his wife because of purity culture. Um, yeah. So anyways, we, uh, man, this is so I'm 35. This is tw- you're talking 20 years ago. Um, we had moments where we didn't have like, we had no direction other than like, don't touch each other. You know what I mean? And there was no like guidance on like how to have like a constructive relationship. Hey, you're 16, like 16 year olds, have hormones right and they feel things and they want things and that's totally normal and okay here's what you do with it to like cause yourself probably the least amount of heartbreak and problems and there was just that just wasn't a conversation that we had it was a conversation that was like you you know you don't like i i want to make my i don't want to make my parents sound like they were um like these hard asses or anything. Cause it was just more like you don't do that until you're married. You know what I mean? It's just, that was the rule. And so how did we survive that? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but we did get married young, you know what I mean? And my, like my wife wanted to have her like college degree done before we got married. And so like, she did like an expedited uh, one of those like two year business classes or business degrees, which she's never used a day in her life. She ended up getting her master's uh, in early childhood education and is now a, a teacher. Uh, she teaches a multiple disabilities classroom. And, but like she, you know, it was just like all of those kind of things that were expected of you before you got married. Like we just like rushed through them. And I don't want to say it was because of sex. But I mean, that you can't deny that that was like this huge part of it, right? You you just like wanted to do the things that young adults do. 
and you couldn't there was no way way to do that you know what i mean we like i moved out of my parents house two weeks before i got married and then she moved in like when we got back from the honeymoon like that's just what we did and that's what everybody did um and the culture man like i just the amount of i i really think i thought about a lot i think the pain more than anything was just caused by like a lack of guidance and understanding and like really more than anything it was like hey like just somebody tell you you wanted somebody to tell you that this was normal like this like it's normal to be attracted to other people right um as long as they're not the same gender as you are and but i like you just wanted some like some sort of um you know uh you wanted someone to tell you that that was normal and that's what i think was you didn't get now there are a hundred layers to purity culture that we could examine you know like psychologically and physically and all the ways that it does harm more than that but i think for me was that's all i think that's all that you really wanted was like it's okay to fall in love with somebody you know what i mean it just had a it just was such a weird thing and like i said i i was the guinea pig in my family and my it my it got lo- much looser for my siblings as they got older so um, so it's interesting to me that what you're talking about too is a, it's a lack of celebration of how you're made which as a christian you would have thought i would have thought mm-hmm. like aren't we the ones that have the kind of the edge on on how this is actually all designed we're not here as a product of evolution we're not animals we're, we're here that you know we're here as people that god created in his image so even something like sex and certainly a lot more mm-hmm. than that but including sex is a design that god put in us to give us some idea of his nature or the, the glory of the gospel or the glory of heaven to yeah. tell us something about himself and certainly you could argue like this is a a very small picture of the kind of gloriousness you know as, as awesome as it is to be enjoying intimacy and even eroticism in life it's, mm-hmm. it's just like this you know it's like a thousandth of a percent or a millionth of a percent of of what the glories of heaven are going to be like and god's just trying to give you a taste of how awesome you're going to see the the the, the amazingness that he's got in store for you and whatever it is or, or just the intimacy like as close as you can feel to somebody on earth imagine that that there's intimacy at, at a totally higher level much much better than eroticism could ever be there is there's an intimacy with the father that, 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 that you know with god that's, that's waiting for you and that you can taste a little bit of here in life and you can enjoy it fully someday in heaven but just the idea of saying if that's what this is about then this sexuality stuff is a glorious thing i'm created as an amazing it's like i'm, the, I'm this monet this renoir or whatever I'm, I'm this amazing painting from god and mm-hmm. he designed this and so like when you feel urges or desires to to look like isn't that a good thing shouldn't i want to look and it's like no no don't look don't look so certainly don't look twice <laughs> mm, <laughs> if you look sure. once accidentally that's fine but don't look twice and it, it really is shocking and i i tell the story a lot yeah. but um when i was in bible college i finished up at lancaster bible college in central pennsylvania mm-hmm. and the dean of students got of men i should say got us together all all the men in the dining hall this one night and i'm i'm expecting like a Guys, I want you to be on fire for God. I want you to, you know, just preach the gospel, live the gospel. I'm expecting something to fire us up. One message, guys, stop the masturbation. That was it. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> you get us together once, hundreds of men, and uh, that's your only message. Anyway, we're, I mean, we're like drains getting clogged, or what's happening here? Like, what? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a, I think he just assumed because probably that's what his, his struggle was, maybe, or his generation is like. I assume every generation struggling with this. And I think he was just trying to say, like, I, I'm, this is my assumption, but I think he was trying to say, like, look, I'm I'm sure that I'm sure that you're struggling with this. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be able to get close to God until you deal with this one issue. And it wasn't like, a, hey, celebrate your sexuality, celebrate your mm-hmm. desires, but keep it under control. It was just like a bad, 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 like you got to stop, you got to stop. And that mm-hmm. message really, whether it's sex or anything else, really, if you tell someone they're bad, 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 you get into now the shame culture where, you feel like you're ashamed. And what's what's surprising to me is how much Christian culture doesn't realize they're they're carving out a place for people to be living in secret. Because if, if mm. someone says, hey, this desire is really bad and shameful, you need to stop. But you're in a spot where you're like, I won't or I can't or I don't feel like I can't. 
Well, if you need, if you're going to be a worship leader or you're going to be a pastor or you're going to be just any kind of public person in the church or Christian community, they need to think that you're falling in line, which means you now have to have two lives, one in front of them and one in the secret. And so you're, while you're, while they're publicly saying modesty culture, purity culture, shame culture, they're actually saying, hey, let's have two cultures. One of them is right. very much a purity culture. One of them is very much an impure culture. Just keep it quiet. They yeah. wouldn't say that, but that's what effectively happens. Yeah, and it leads to so much abuse, so much abuse, and not just uh, outside of like marriage, but inside of marriage, it leads to so much abuse. Yeah, um, men especially feel like they've had to like withhold themselves for years, and then they get married, and they do they don't know how to like live in a relationship with their wives. Yeah, um, and that leads to all sorts of sexual and physical abuse. I've seen it. I mean yet you just you hear these things working in churches for so long and uh it's for me it all, it all i always remember thinking along those same lines as like if we're made in the image of god like then all of this is part of that image of god and i remember always having the question of like is god a man we always say god's man he you know we refer to him as he and I remember answers to those questions were always like, of course, God's not a man. He's more like a spirit or a being that is male and female, or he created both male and female. Um, but like women are also made in the image of God, but there was clearly a hierarchy and a patriarchy, right? It was, that was obvious. And so um, I just finished reading uh, Jesus and John Wayne. I don't know if you've read that. And I've heard of it. I've not read it yet. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's worth reading. It's really like a historical overview of kind of like the main players in evangelicalism dating back to the early 1900s. And yeah, there's like several chapters just like on the sexual abuses of men in power and so many of them, you know, and it just, that's what it does. Like, um, you know, what is it? suppression is the it, suppression always leads to desire, you know, like that's yeah. kind of like psychology 101. And I'm sure there are areas uh, in my own life that I probably have discovered or am yet to discover, discovering all the time where it's like, you know, how I relate to my wife, how she relates to me. There are, are deep psychological roots that are from purity culture that we, continue to work through all the time. And I'm sure, you know, the people that did survive and have, you know, somewhat healthy relationships, I'm sh the, the people I know, you know, we talk to them and you're like, yeah, but this is it's just, it, it springs up on you and you don't even realize it, you know? Yeah. I think it's a couple of thoughts um, come to mind. One of them is just, I think it's really hard too for people that really just want to do it right. They just want to honor God. They're not mm -hmm. too caught up in too much of the weird extremes of it all, but they just want to really honor God and then have a great marriage that I think a lot of them struggle with the idea of being able to enjoy the intimacy and eroticism in the way that um, I would certainly wish for any you know married couple to enjoy where mm -hmm. they're just totally able to give themselves to it. And I, I was, I did a lot of research even as a Christian years ago on, on the, this, our perspectives on the body. And I don't want to take too much more time just to, cause this isn't only about the body, but um, I was reading a bunch of books about how people deal with this, especially people that go through like the really deep indoctrination of purity culture. Like I was, I was exposed from like a Josh McDowell perspective. I don't know if you know him, oh, yeah. but um, love, love weights and all that stuff. And then mm -hmm. um, uh, certainly um, Joshua Harris came along later, but you'd read these stories of these people that, they did everything right. They looked like the perfect Christian, you know, guy or girl, but they would get married. And at least a lot of the ladies kind of hated sex because they'd just been trained so much to be like prim and proper, you know, you know, cover up. And like, it is, you, you can't flip a switch and be like, look, don't ever show any skin. And then suddenly turn into this absolute, you know, uh, absolutely erotic person in bed. Now that you're married, you, you can't flip that switch. And for a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure they eventually figure it out, but for a lot of people, it's like, it's permanently like off. Like I can't just yeah. become eroticism is bad. That's not part of God's glory and, and it being made in his image to them. It's part of the fall. And yeah. especially when you mix it in with this whole thing of it's mostly for procreation. But the other thing I was yeah. going to mention that 
never and just endlessly shocks me is that women in this day and age as Christians aren't more offended at the Bible's message. Like it says that there's two different, at least two different uh, versions of the creations where they merged together, as we know. But mm-hmm. one of them says that God gave Adam all these animals to pick as a partner and none was found. So he put him to sleep and took a rib and made Eve. Mm-hmm. So Eve's like an afterthought, like you don't really need her. And that like <laughs> that alone is an issue. And then it says, you know, Eve was the one that mm-hmm. took the fruit first. And I think it was first or second Timothy talks about Eve being in, in, in deceived was in the transgression. So she really brought this on us, even though Adam did it too. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're from Romans, you know, judicially in Adam, but Eve was the one that did it. But when you look at some of the origin stories, like I, I've been reading a lot about where when you read the New Testament, where it's actually quoting from. And a lot of people don't know, for example, that uh, the New Testament's quoting Enoch like a hundred times mm. and Jubilees dozens of times and all uh, lots of other stuff. But in the book of Enoch and other stories like that, they blame the women, but they do it a little differently. The, the, the sin issue is not as much in the Garden of Eden. It's that the, the, the Nephilim, the, um, you know, these, these angels came down and were seduced by the beauty, beauty of women on earth. And so when they, you know, then they mate with them and have the Nephilim, the giants, and that that's the, that's the big issue as to where sin came from. And then these, 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 this whole culture just gets enmeshed in a lot of bad stuff because of the angels being tempted by the women. So whichever story you pick as the main origin of sin, women are the big problem. Yeah. And then of course you mix in, Hey, you're impure, stay outside of the camp. Um, New Testament, a woman should stay silent, ask her husband at home. Like, why would you want your daughters to hear this message? Do, do you struggle with that at all? You know, I mean, does that resonate resonate with you? Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, I have three boys. Not, I don't have any girls, but um, part of, you know, and they're still young. They're, like I said, nine, seven, and one. But part of how we are trying to navigate raising them is without shame, Right obviously figuring the line out between like um you know shame and kind of like cultural rules and lines and consent and like they're little boys right they're nine and seven like they they fight and they wrestle and they think penises are hilarious and all of the normal things little boys do and how to like pair that with like hey yes penises are hilarious but like we should keep that in this, you know, in the house. And then, but like what, how far is too far without shaming them, but also being like, I don't want you to grow up and think you can do this in public because you'll lose your career. You know what I mean? As a man, you are, there are lines culturally. And what I would say, like you have to, um, keep these things like privates, maybe not the right word, but you have to like kind of know what the cultural boundaries are and be able to separate that from like the shame. There's no, no, it's different. It's not a shame thing. It's like a cultural respect thing. And so like, how do you parent that with boys to, for them to know the difference between shame in their body and like cultural expectations, which are are good in many you know respects and so um yeah and so i think i in that sense i'm thankful that i don't have to parent girls (laughs) because that would be a a, do you have girls i mean is that something you yeah we got two boys and two girls yeah yeah Yeah, one thing that was really helpful to me was artwork did you did you ever find that just seeing um like I found Christians who, what I mean is Christians, like I went up to, when, when I went to Bob Jones, they have this huge art gallery. It's second in the whole world in value for Western religious art only to the Vatican. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of stuff. I personally worked there and I was guarding Rembrandts. It was really cool. But they had these Baroque era nudes. And I was like, as a conservative Christian, like, what is that doing at Bob Jones? Are you kidding me? But I asked some people about it and they're like, no, no, this, this, is, this is artwork. The body is art. And in an appropriate sense, you know, it, it's not pornography. And it really kind of shook me up at the time. It's like, I don't know about this, but, and that's, that's the effect of the purity culture, of course, and the modesty culture, but it, it started some wheels turning and I realized like, oh, okay. So there, there are different categories. Not every naked body is pornography. Yeah. What does that look like? And 
you, you, to me, raising kids with appropriate art is a big, uh, a great idea to get that ball. That is a good idea. Absolutely. That's a great idea for sure. Well, I know you, you talked, uh, a little bit so far about uh, science evolution. I'd love to dive into that a little bit. What did you discover in that era? In that area, and was that part of your deconstruction, or was that mm. after? Like, what what role did that play in in turning the yeah. tide for you? It was the start of my deconstruction. Um, so, young Earth creationism was like all I knew until I don't know, probably high school. I mean, early high school. Uh, I, it may honestly, if I'm being honest, the first time I remember is probably later than high school. Later, than high, I knew there were like I knew people existed that were like theistic evolutionists, and I knew there were evolutionists. Never had studied it, and I remember um, I, probably the first year I was married. We got married in 2007, and so the first year I was married, I remember watching this debate between um, Christopher Hitchens and John Lennox. Maybe you're familiar with those. Mm-hmm. And when they, they agreed, and I remember like, obviously I'm like rooting for Lennox, but I had a lot of respect for Hitchens even then. Like I thought this guy was a brilliant man and all that kind of stuff. And I learned a lot, I read his book. I learned a lot from him and how to like critique thought, right? Critique ideas. But these two agreed that the world was, or that humanity was at least a hundred thousand years old. And it like stopped me in my tracks. Cause it was just like this little sense, like they, yeah, hundred thousand is probably right. And I'm going, wait a second, back up here. I know this isn't what you were talking about, but like, I had never, I had never seen like this uh, Christian who I thought was kind of like this high intellectual person. Yeah. Humanity is a hundred thousand. And that like, it blew my mind. And so I had always been fascinated by like dinosaurs. And yet, I mean, I went, I met Kent Hovind as a kid. He came to my school. Um, I most definitely met Ken Ham as well uh, at a I'm conference. So <laughs> I know, I, I know. And that was just kind of all we knew. Now, I remember even as I got older, feeling like the Answers in Genesis people had become a lot more um unfair and i i was like i just don't necessarily like think their tactics are all that like christian <laughs> you know what i mean i felt like they were kind of harsh and like the snarkiness and, yeah the snark i didn't i remember thinking that even like you know in my early 20s but once i kind of started like going down that road it um i went from creation the like i went from young earth creationism to then like old earth creationism and i discovered like hugh ross and those kind of people who still held to like this uh version of scripture that was that held scripture as like this inerrant thing but they just said no these words don't mean like day doesn't mean day day means an age and i remember going through the hebrew and that is actually what kind of started my like leaving my church is that so once I started asking these questions and our church had an answers in Genesis guy, like come and do this like two night conference. And we're talking like the church I was at, we're talking now um, like more modern evangelical, like, you know, full bands, like the whole big, big box evangelical church. Right. Um, to this day, like, you know, our town, the town it's in is, 18,000 people and there's a few surrounding towns with four or 5,000 people and they run 2,500 a Sunday. I mean, it's like a big, you know, it's a huge, huge place. And so I started kind of asking these questions. I was like, Hey, this doesn't make a lot of sense. I had a friend who was like kind of throwing out the whole Bible. Like he was like, no, this, this isn't, this young earth creation, this stuff isn't true. Like I'm out, I'm out of Christianity completely. And I'm going like, that's probably not something worth leaving Christianity for why? Like, can't we have like a more open and well-rounded discussion about this? And I started asking these questions to my pastors and the, the swift and concise answer was no, we cannot have these conversations. This is the only way to read this. And, um, you know, I have, I got answers like, there if god wanted to put it any clearer he couldn't have 
Like that's, you know, that's kind of like the answers I got. And so and the remember, stand was just to be clear is, is that the earth was probably about six to 10,000 years old max. Yep. There was six an Adam 000. and Eve. There was a real Noah. There was a real flood. Mm -hmm. It was most likely the whole planet. You know, just what they said, you know, there, there were people that lived eight, 900 years old. Yep. But what they said in the Bible, especially in Genesis was to be read pretty much literally, unless it was explicitly symbolic, but otherwise right. this, this really happened. This is, this is, it's a history book. Yeah. History book for sure. And a science book, yeah. which to me was wild back then because I'm like, why are you not flat earthers? If you, this is a science book, right? Um, because the way they were getting to young earth was no more convincing than like the things about the angels in the four corners of the earth. Like it was the same type of, to me, be, it, it became like obviously metaphorical language. Hmm. And so even that felt inconsistent, but I, I remember a specific time where I had, um, yeah, I've been doing like tons of research. I mean, just mostly from this, like I had found this the kind of the old earth perspective and I was just enthralled by it. And cause it just, all of a sudden it made sense to me that, okay, my pastor and my science teacher, not, not that I ever went to a public school, but my pastor and the scientists were saying two different things. And, and it, it gave me this way of like melding the two together where maybe they're both a little bit wrong. Maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? That, okay. So the Bible may still be inerrant, but it doesn't have to mean that the earth is actually 6,000 years old, because even then all of the science to me started like breaking down and falling apart. When I learned that there were satellites that could measure the rate of plate movement, like by the centimeters per year, and that you could extrapolate back so far when the mountains were underwater, and then you could run a, um, you know, you could test the seashells on the top of that mountain and those two, the, you know, for age and those two numbers would match up. Hmm. That that was it for me. I was like, okay, well, and my pastor used to have a freaking uh, seashell that he got on some mountain and he was like, see, it was the flood. And I'm going, wait, no, that doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't see seashells on every mountain. <laughs> like we see seashells on kind of more coastal areas, right? Coastal mountains, that kind of thing. And so like, for me, it was like, okay, the science is like, yeah, sure. There's a lot of unknowns, but the earth is obviously not 6,000 years old. Like we have human records that go past 10, 15,000 years. Right. And so, um, don't they even have like artwork in caves that are at least 40,000 years, I think. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and they would, you know, you know, all the spiels with, with kind of the, dating methods were faulty and all this baloney. Well, can I throw in the, the, the one thing that I think really gets to the heart of where you might call it the, the terrorizing side of it in the sense that like we can talk about certain ideas and as long as they don't threaten these core beliefs, then mm -hmm. we're, we're cool. We can talk about this. But when you start to get into evolution, people can kind of ignore some of the age stuff and what, like what it implies. Mm -hmm. But when you get to what does this mean about human evolution, you're getting down to original sin. Was there an Adam and Eve? Did we come from other primates? When you start to add that in and you're like, well, maybe there wasn't an Adam and Eve, especially once you realize that a lot of this is like copied from other mythologies, mm -hmm. where you can really see like the Egyptian, the Garden of Aten. You can see Gilgamesh with the Noah story. You're like, okay. And there's probably a lot more weaved in here that woven in here that I'm not even aware of, but I right. can I can see a few mythologies that stand out pretty clearly. Um, now you're thinking, well, if there's no Adam and Eve, then they didn't really sin. So what's the sin problem? And mm -hmm. why does you know? And it, it just you real start turning like, where is why does it have to be a a, a blood sacrifice? Like where you know did, did the yeah. primates you know did the Neanderthals need to do blood <laughs> sacrifice? Did they need exactly. blood magic? What you know, did the, the primates before the Neanderthals, you know, and it it do, it does kind of terrorize people because they're like, you're suddenly not talking about evolution anymore. Mm. Now you're saying, maybe my whole worldview and belief system is off. Yeah, and and that the implication of maybe that my God isn't isn't what I thought he was. He's either real or he's not real or he's different. Maybe heaven's not what I thought it was because if they made this story up, what else did they make up? Yeah. And it's like you're just cracking that door a little bit. Yeah. You're like how far does it go? 
Absolutely. And, and that's what happened to me. If, if I had been reading the Bible wrong about this, how else have I been reading the Bible wrong? Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was massive. So I remember I, a few months before I left, I had one friend who's still a good friend who was at the church with me, who we had kind of like been talking and like, he was kind of, you know, on my side, quote unquote, you know, this, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Why are we having answers in Genesis at the church? What was so funny is like a side note, like when I think of answers in Genesis, I don't think of like big, like modern day evangelical churches that have like, you know, Hillsong music and Bethel music. Like I don't think of that, but that's kind of what this church was. But, you know, the pastors went to Liberty back in the day. I mean, there's just, obviously that's where the theology came from. And so um, we had this meeting so it was my friend and I and like three of the pastors, one of the pastor's kids who was like on staff. And I remember like, so my dad was on staff and still is on staff there as an assistant pastor. And I remember kind of talking with him through that. And anytime like we would, send an email back. It started as an email chain, which I liked better because I could formulate a thought without getting shut down. Right. And, but I would send him the email first and, and be like, is this okay to send? Like, did I say anything disrespectful, et cetera. And I just wasn't getting like the participation from the, like no one wanted to answer these questions and I would get questions or responses to like these well thought out deep questions about how the nature of scripture, et cetera, with, these responses, like what I said, like God couldn't have written any clearer. Thanks. Like, and I'm going, well, this isn't like, I'm on staff here. Like, this is like, I'm on your team. Like have this conversation with me. And so we had this like kind of meeting. And I think that was when, when I look back of like regrets, I don't think I should have ever gone to that meeting. And for one, because I was a 25 year old kid with no actual theological training walking into these, walking into the room with like these pastors who had been entrenched in it and had training their entire lives. And I'm expecting myself or trying to like defend something that I've been into for a few months. Right. When obviously there are, we're, people that could have done it far better than I could have. It was a bad idea. And, you know, I, I just, I wasn't given kind of like the, I was given the floor, but I wasn't, no one took me seriously. Right. I had this roles been reversed. I probably wouldn't have taken them seriously, which is okay. But I didn't feel like I was valued or respected. And that kind of, I think, got under my skin. And so as I continued to study it, um, I probably, I mean, I, so I did like all the youth music too. And, um, I probably talked to a few more people about it than I should have, but it was only a few and it was only like close friends. And just that I was like, one thinking that this was a harmful thing that the church was teaching because I could, I had a, my friend was leaving Christianity because of it. Right. He was gone. And I'm going like, why are we letting this guy just leave? Like, Hmm. you know, why, why are we not at least sending him in another direction? And so, um, at the time, like I said, I was like the assistant worship leader. So, which meant I did all the midweek stuff and I played on Sunday mornings, kind of whatever instrument that they needed me to play and I would sing a song or whatever, but there was still like a head worship guy. Well, the head worship guy leads leaves. And so in the interim, I take over. And so, like I said, this is a big church. This is a really, really well-paying job. And at the time, um, my band, we had gone through our record deal stuff, which we can talk about that if you want, but, and we had, we were winding down, I basically had spent the first five years, five, six years of my marriage, like chasing this dream of being in a rock band. And we were broke. I mean, it was like, 
it, we never made a dime doing it. And it was just a real struggle. And here I am, boom, I got this job. Like this is going to, we're going to be set. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I was technically like the interim guy. And if I got my timeline, right, I think this was a few, probably a year before I actually left. Um, this would have been 2012. And I remember thinking, I, I don't think I want this job and kind of like my friends and family going like, are you sure? Like, are you, are you sure you don't want to at least like, yeah. and when I say that I was the interim guy, but I had not expressed my interest in becoming the full-time guy. I'm assuming I could be wrong. I'm assuming had I said, I want this job, they would have given me the job. Um, after a few months, this would have probably been as I'm starting just very first starting to deconstruct. I tell them, go ahead and hire somebody. I like, we're going to do the band for another year. I want to be able to travel, you know, the timing's not right, et cetera. Looking back, that was probably the best thing I ever did because the same thing would have happened, except I just would have been leaving a lot more money on the table, <laughs> which made it would have made it way worse. And so they hired a guy, which also ended up being great because he was only there two years and um, him and his wife turned into some of our closest friends in the world. And his wife is still like my wife's very best friend. And so that ended up being a good thing. But so he was there. He's kind of seeing all this stuff with me. What I felt so bad about it was he moved across the country, like for my job. And then, um, we, you know, no regret. He doesn't have any regrets. But at that moment, after that, that big meeting, um, there was like this meeting. It was like, hey, you don't have to believe in a young earth to work here, but we, you just can't talk about it. You can't. And I, you know, from like kind of the authoritarian, like church continuity perspective, I understand that you don't want your staff, you know, that kind of thing. So I said, you know, give me a couple of days. And they said, take a month, take two months, think about it, whatever. Talked about it with my wife. And the next week I went in there and resigned yeah. and I had to talk to my, you know, my parents, my, like my parents still work there. Um, all of our, my in-laws all are there. My father-in-law works there now. Um, and yeah, it was, that was a really, really tough thing to leave for sure. It was just tough. It's crazy that they wouldn't want to establish too a place where you could ask questions. Like you said, with your friend that left mm -hmm. that that's just like such a common theme a repeating theme that you see um, in so many of these stories of where somebody says, I, took the, the, the bravery that it took to, to ask some hard questions and I, either I got shut down, I got told I didn't have faith, I got told, you know, just be quiet, stop asking these questions, keep it to yourself, some version of the above. And it's like, they, like the Christian community really doesn't see that as like, you don't realize if they don't get good answers from you, they're yeah. not going to suddenly say, oh, okay, well, I guess if they said to stop asking questions, I'll just stop asking questions. Like, no, we live in the age of the internet. They're going to go find answers somewhere else. <laughs> right. And the problem is if they find answers that are better than mm. they expected, they're probably going to keep on chewing. Cause like, okay, I thought I might find some uh, so, so answers I can work with. They end up finding answers that are much, much better that lead them even further away from the church. Yeah. And it's like, you can't, you shut people's brains off at the door and they're not going to do it. They're not going to put up with that. Their people are smarter than that. Yeah. And I think when it, it makes like we, we start talking about like the inerrancy of scripture type thing, that is really the root there. They, they don't want that idea that like, oh, there's multiple, like the idea that our interpretation is inerrant. That's what it comes down to. It's not the scripture is inerrant. It's our interpretation of the scripture and it is inerrant. And we don't want that to be undermined because yeah. that disrupts the flow of the church from that kind of more authoritarian perspective i understand right like it's not healthy quote unquote for me to be like causing that disruption um from my perspective i'm going who cares like we're we're not talking about penal substitution which was like like i said the pillar of our faith 
we're talking about creation theology. Who cares? Like, this is something that to me seems like should be something you can have discussions and dis healthy disagreements about and live in harmony with each other disagreeing. And it was like, no. <laughs> now, when I left, they were like, do you want us to find, you know, a church we can, we will gladly write you a recommendation. You know, we can help you find a church. And at the time I was like, I'm, you know, I hadn't left Christianity, but I had gone like, I'm not doing, you know, worship leading for a good while. Mm -hmm. um, well, could I so, yeah. Yeah. I know we're, um, we're going to give a little bit of time at the end for you to mm -hmm. play a song, but I um, just wanted to ask what was, you're like as you're deconstructing you're asking some hard questions and maybe we could do a follow-up at some point to, to yeah. dive into some more of those uh in more in much more detail i'd love to but like what was the final outcome where you got to a point where you you, you changed like what was that like and what did you change to where i guess another way to put it is where are you landing at this point with all the questions and answers mm. so i think in my email i told you at this point i would i'd call myself like a christ-leaning mystic and it took several years to get to that point. Um, it started with like reading people like Richard Rohr and uh, Pete Enns was a massive one. Pete Enns helped me put the Bible in like a proper perspective as far as like, what is it, right? Like, what is it? What is it actually? Um. And so that helped me figure out kind of like what I'm doing. And I went from that church, we we joined another church and I was there for a year and then I joined another church and each church kind of got like grass dra um, gradually a little more uh, progressive, I guess you could say. Um, and then I joined a United Methodist church where I am now where I am free to um, be completely open and honest with my pastors mm -hmm. and they're the things that I find worth standing for now are the things they stand for and they're community focused. They do a lot of good in the community and I, you know, we can, literally sit around and have conversations um we're we're just free to express ourselves without shame or judgment and that kind of thing and i can be like you know today i think i'm a pantheist and that's like cool man <laughs> you know what i mean and that's just uh that's just part of why i feel comfortable there the the, co the congregation is still pretty conservative and so we're always like on this tightrope of like how do we guide this con congregation uh but but at least i have the freedom to be who i am right and so yeah how i got there i just read the biggest thing honestly i took a job delivering pizzas and i worked like 30 hours a week doing pizzas and i was just in the car and so i just annihilated so many audiobooks and podcasts i mean just more than i could even tell you about and that was uh, the most, most important few years of my life for sure. Can I ask, uh, since we're running through time, I want to ask you a few high point questions. Yeah. Um, two of them really. Uh, the first one is about the bad stuff. Uh, mm. The Bible is pretty weird. It talks, starts mm. with talking snakes as donkeys, the sun standing still, um, manna falling from heaven. Uh, but it gets into stuff like, and, and a lot of other stuff, you know, the Red Sea parting or the Reed Sea the flat earth you talked about, the earth being on top of pillars, but it gets into angels of death that kill the firstborn. It talks about genital mutilation, obviously, uh, blood magic, scapegoating. It talks about favoritism, you know, God picking people and then uh, choosing other people to be vessels of wrath, mixed up with tribalism, uh, a lot of discrimination um, in the Old Testament. God doesn't just put up with, but he specifically commands mass murder, you know, genocide, uh, a lot of warmongering. Um, showing no mercy uh, in Nehemiah talks about, you know, Hey, you've, you've been inter intermarried. I want you to literally send your wives away because they're not, uh, they're not uh, Jewish. Uh, so, you know, you've got all this stuff. You've got women uh, being mistreated. We talked about, you got slavery. Uh, it goes on and on that this, this 
apartheid, this bloodthirstiness, this forced eviction, land theft, controlling nasty stuff, um, prisoners of war, uh, child brides or worse, um, endless violence and brutality in the Old Testament. Um, King David, the, the supposed singer of all these songs, taking, killing 200 men, cutting off the end of their penises as a, as a trophy for his wife. Priests administered abortions with, with magic dust water. Uh, throwing out the lepers and the unclean women. Um, if a, your daughter's raped, uh, you know, the, the man can just give you some shekels of silver and then you give her to him, to the rapist, as, as, and so forth. It goes on and on, stoning people, yeah. dashing babies' heads against the rocks. Uh, there are a lot of people that just say, I don't see a reason to stay. If mm -hmm. your book can't just say, for example, not your book, meaning Christians, like why can't mm -hmm. they just say, don't own people, like slavery's wrong? It never says that. Um, in fact, the New Testament just says, you know, submit to your masters and so forth. How did you deal with those bad things as they kind of became more, you know, prevalent in your thinking? One of the most uh, light bulb moments I had was when I asked my pastor about how he deals with those questions. And he gave me the answer, you know, that if God commanded it, it becomes morally acceptable. Hmm. And I just thought to myself that for one, that makes no freaking sense at all, because I've been told since I was a baby that God never changes, right? Well, you're telling me God changes now and, you know, that he's a ruthless, murderous, bloodthirsty dictator made no sense to me. And was like I, that to me, that I, that was psychologically traumatizing for sure. Um once you're being asked to defend him, to believe and defend him, and if he's a god of genocide and all this other stuff, then you technically have to fall in line and say, "Yep, God had a right to slaughter everybody." Yeah, it just you have you can't say God was wrong. You cannot yeah. go there. I definitely went through a, a period of like apologetics, studying the apologetics of that, like people that were defending God or defending, you know, like how the scripture was written, or maybe maybe it didn't. And I, I never bought it. And I just thought, maybe people wrote this. Maybe the people who wrote this uh, thought, interpreted them, you know, claiming the spoils of war as the blessing from God. Therefore, God must have commanded it. Hey, we murdered all these people. We get to keep their women and, and their cows and their goods. That's a good thing. It must be from God because all good is from God, right? That's the kind of like, maybe that is the, you know, most obvious answer yeah. and i would say that all of all of the old testament stuff is probably the biggest catalyst for me just going oh people wrote it what you're talking about basically this where did it come from why did mm -hmm. you know why are they defending these bad things maybe it's just men writing it it's not from god they're blaming god or, or attributing it to god but the whole idea of where did it come from becomes even broader and bigger of an issue where you, you look at a couple of things. And I, I wanted to ask you, as I, I'm going to give a few examples and then ask you, number one, did your church ever tell you about this stuff? I know, I'm sure you know a lot of this by now and probably even more, but um, did they tell you it? And then how did you deal with it once you just, you know, went through this yourself? When we dive into the Old Testament God character, we're of course at first just presented with him as this is, this is God, he's Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And kind of you say, if, if God says it, it's morally right. If we understood the white hot holiness of God, we would agree with him. And in, in, in eternity future, we will. We'll look, it says, I think in Ezekiel or Isaiah, we'll look on the corpses of the people that he has slaughtered and we will rejoice. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's, and God has the right to. In Romans 9, he has the right to make vessels for honor and dishonor. And it's up to him and we cannot talk back to him. But when you say, all right, well, who is this guy that's doing this then? Let's, let's talk about not what he commands and do I agree with it or does it make me cringe, but who is this? When you look historically at it, the Yahweh character was a heavily evolved story that was already part of a much bigger, different story. You have this God named Elyon who has many sons and he has a wife named Asherah. And then eventually the other sons disappear and suddenly it's, it's mostly about Yahweh. And suddenly they kind of get merged, and now Yahweh has the wife Asherah. And if you look at, like, at all the archaeological stuff, Asherah is actually named a lot more in their digs. You know, they pull stuff out of the ground over there. You see the name Asherah a lot more than you see the name Yahweh. But it talks about Yahweh and his wife Asherah a lot. And so you get this picture. 
And eventually Ashra somehow gets pulled out of the equation, I'm guessing because they didn't want a, a female in power. They wanted to be a male-dominated patriarchy. So he's the only god now. And eventually, and you kind of see s stories that, like woven in with the, the female side where the wisdom cries in the streets. Um, you know, like a female as if it's God and the Holy Spirit is often mm -hmm. portrayed as a, in, a, in a female sense in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But you get this Yahweh character who's nasty, but he's we're concerned about who, what he's doing, but now we're like concerned, who is, is this even just made up? It sounds like he's a, a Canaanite God that evolved, which is ironic for the people that hate the evolution to be, to be defending it. It's like your God has evolved. But then you get just, if, even if they didn't want to admit that stuff, which is, it's hard to not admit it because it's, it's, it's archeologically provable, but then you get to the new Testament and you find out where it comes, that comes from. And you find out that they're quoting from, endless other sources. Like I mentioned, I've, I've found over a hundred quotes from the book of Enoch in the Protestant New Testament canon. Dozens and dozens from Jubilees, from Maccabees. Um, I've got a list of from, from uh, the Wisdom of Solomon. The, the, the book of Romans is quotes, quotes from the Wisdom of Solomon all over the place. Uh, Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, Esdras, Judith, Tobit, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs a lot. The Assumption of Moses, the book of Joshua, the life of Adam and Eve. It's just quoting other stuff all over the place. It's quote the Dead Sea Scrolls, which you talked about earlier a lot. Jesus quotes from the Dead Sea Scrolls repeatedly. Um, they quote from Plutarch. Uh, Luke quotes from Plutarch extensively. Luke quotes from Josephus extensively. Uh, they, Luke and Acts heavily borrow from Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, as well as from Euripides Bacchae and from Virgil. They see the Gospel of Mark being based structurally in the zodiac symbols in the correct order of the constellations. Uh, we see quotes from uh, other, not just, we see quotes from other philosophers, not just like in Acts where Paul clearly is saying, I'm quoting your philosopher, but even like in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, they're weaving in quotes from Plato and Socrates and people don't know about it. <laughs> um, the endless things like that. There's yeah. uh, 40 plus gospels. There's six books of Acts. We know that there are forgeries and counter forgeries, even within the canon itself. Uh, there's a lot of stuff from Pythagoras and numerology, Gematria, early Kabbalah, uh, the Pythagorean concepts like John 21 with 153 fish. Like that's that's a Pythagoras magic number. Uh, the first two chapter of, uh, chapters of Luke, all over Revelation, magic numbers everywhere from Pythagoras and this stuff. And we know the Essenes were Pythagoreans, ironically. Um, so you get all this stuff that looks like it's Pythagoras, Essene, Greco-Roman mystery cult stuff, a lot of Homer, um, a lot of intertestamental second temple period stuff. And you're like, when you take that all out and you say, all right, well, if he's quoting from here, if this is a quote from Homer, if this is a quote from Plato, what's left that's just legitimate? And did you, number one, again, did you did you hear about that stuff? And, and once you learned some of this stuff, what does that do to your faith? Because uh, yeah. because it, it does beg, who's 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 doing this? Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a mess. It's a mess. Um, I never heard any of that stuff. I always just heard the the originals were um, inerrant in their, you know, in their original Hebrew, Latin, and Greek form. The idea that it was a messy process was never something um, we heard. In fact, we heard the opposite. We heard that this was a straightforward process done by these meticulous translators, you know, over the courses of centuries. Yada yada. Never heard any of that stuff. Have they talked Once, about Yahweh's wife at all, or all no, that? no, never, never heard any of it. And, and wasn't Yahweh kind of more um, evolution out of? You mentioned L, like L was kind of like the first, yeah, yeah God a name with all these sons, you know, Baal and all that. Yeah, and so never heard any of that stuff. Um, when I learned it, I think I had already kind of come to that point where I figured people wrote it and learning that it was messier than I thought it I was in a good place to be able to like accept that information right I was in a place where I was like okay what is there to what is left right and I think for me so when I say like I'm a Christ-leaning mystic um, m one of my favorite things that Richard Rohr says is that literalism is the lowest form of meaning and that to mm. me was a profound idea because I can read the gospels and I can read the sermon on the Mount and whether or not Jesus said that, whether or not Jesus existed, 
doesn't matter to me anymore. Do I find it? Do I find those conversations interesting? Absolutely. Does it affect how the words look at the birds affect me? No. How to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, the nonviolence of Jesus, the character of Jesus made up or not to me, the, the energy and the message is still deeply profound and meaningful in my life. Is there a heaven? I have no idea. Did Jesus exist? Maybe in some form, maybe a conglomeration of people may, you know, something happened. Does it, does it change the way I read the sermon on the Mount now? Only in the sense that it becomes, I have a deeper understanding of like where it came from, the cultural norms at the time, et cetera. But to me, like, look at the birds. That is a, a deep, deeply profound a sentence as I could think of. And so when I say I'm a Christ leaning mystic on my good days, um, that is, that is the energy. And I don't say that in like a hippie type of way, but like, a that is, that is the kind of force I want to bring into the world where I say like this place, this is magic because who the hell knows how we got here, but we're here in this moment right now is all we have. Um, I got into this discussion yesterday with some of my good friends about like the difference between pantheism and panentheism and how we had to, we had to agree on our uh, definitions of the two terms, but how um, if panentheism was this idea that God, everything, all creation was an expression of God, an expression of God's nature, but that God still existed as either a being or an energy outside of creation. And that our existence um, would, would continue or continue in some form or fashion, like afterward we die. If that is included in the definition of panentheism, then I consider myself a pantheist who hopes the panentheists are right. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. I can't, I can't go there yet. I used to be there, but I've, I, to me, I have lost all ability to like give um, you know, the word God, uh, credit for, for being a being to me, it makes sense, much more sense to say God is being, um, being itself. And that can get hard to parse out, especially as someone who still gets up in front of a church and sings songs about Jesus on Sunday. Um, it really narrows down your song choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say it really narrows can, down your song choices. Can I, can I ask and and uh, I'll, yeah. I'll make this my my last question and then mm -hmm. pass it over for for your song. But I struggle as a as an atheist, and I do. Mm -hmm. I when I deconverted, I just I was all the way out. I was out within an hour. I was like, this isn't real. This this is this is totally unreal. I struggle with adopting other people's spirituality as if I have any obligation to do, mm. like. Like when you think about it, you think, all right, the Jesus story evolved obviously out of Judaism. The Judaism story evolved obviously out of uh, Egypt and Mesopotamia. And if you're a minimalist, which I am at this point, uh, all signs point to that the Old Testament was actually written much later than we think. So uh, as, as crazy as it sounds to some people, probably a heavily Greek influence as well. Um, you do see stories, uh, see in Greek influence in, in a lot of the stories, especially like King David and so forth. But when you look at this stuff, you think, if I adopt it, if in other words, if, if I do anything more than read it the way I would read any ancient story of Zeus or um, whatever, it's mythology. Mm -hmm. But to say, to adopt it in some way as like, I'm going to use my life, I'm going to use this as a part of my guidance. It's going to morally instruct me. Um, I'm basically taking the spirituality of a bunch of of dead men, obviously, uh, who wrote it a long time ago, and it's been heavily edited and redacted, like we talked about since then. A lot of influences that some of them are very questionable, and others we mm -hmm. don't even will no, never know where some of it came from. But 
they were men that clearly couldn't say don't own people. They were men no. that couldn't say, um, uh, you know, women are just as important as men. They mm -hmm. were people who clearly believed in blood magic and clearly were had no problem telling kids you're broken without our psycho God and, and his, his ability to redeem you. I find the gospel message and the Bible irredeemable, if that makes sense. Like, I think there's yeah. some, some interesting things there. And I study, I'm in my Bible nonstop. I probably read several chapters a day. Um, I guess three to five chapters of the Bible at least a day, which is <laughs> pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm reading books about the Bible nonstop. I am in this book all the time. So I'm not saying there's nothing to, gl to glean like in terms of an education from it of, of our history. Yeah. But I guess I, another way to put it is I struggle with progressive Christianity. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, does that sound like it's an extreme response to you? Or do you feel like there is something worth going to? You obviously go to a, a Methodist church. You said, like, where, what part of this is acceptable to keep and also maybe a, a side corollary is it ever appropriate in your mind to fight mythology as like to actually take a make a platform and say this mythology is just it's it's like holding a stick of dynamite in your hands mm -hmm. we might be able to get a progressive christianity generation for a couple of generations but the chances that somebody's going to turn the literalist on this and get back into a king james mentality is pretty high and once yeah. they do they're going to of course have to teach their kids this stuff it feels to me like progressive Christianity is trying to play with a stick of dynamite and say, it's going to be okay. And yeah. I just, I feel like it's going to blow in their faces. And I'm just curious what you think about that. I agree completely. And progressive fundament or progressive Christianity can have an element of fundamentalism in it very easily. And you're just, you know, it's two sides of the same coin for me any belief I have now, I try to hold it like this, right? Open-handed. Like I, I try to not cling to any sort of actual belief, especially if, um, yeah, I, I, something like heaven is a great example, right? I think heaven is a, by our own human nature, we all want to see our loved ones again, right? That's undeniable. Everybody wants to see their grandparents again or their, you know, whatever, any, any loved one that they've lost. And heaven was so much harder for me to let go of than hell because psychologically I didn't want to let go of heaven. And hmm. so for me, any belief system like that causes suffering. Belief just will naturally lead to suffering of some sort, whether it's psychological, whatever. And so you have, when you say examine mythology, yeah, I I'm all about it. I want to examine all the mythology. I want to examine the things that I believe about culture and the world and myself and history, et cetera. Um, because my moral pillar now is like, do no harm, you know, like leave the world better than I found it. Hmm. That moral pillar is not based for me anymore on like my religious upbringing, the Bible. Now I uncover things all the time about myself in my daily life where I go, I bet my behavior is based on how I was raised and that may be harmful. So I'm guilty of that all the time. But as far insane. as, yeah, as far as like, what do I want my moral pillar to be? It is, yeah, do no harm um, and create a deeply meaningful and present existence in life for, for me, my kids, et cetera, people around me. Does that mean that someday I might have to like leave the church altogether? A hundred percent. As soon as I, as soon as I feel like, doing this work at this church, which is minimal. I'm there on Sundays. I don't have duties during the week or anything like that. It's very low paying. Like I show up Sunday morning for two hours, play a few songs, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not like I'm full-time on staff in, or anything like it used to be, right? It's literally a two hour on Sunday mornings type thing, which is the most I want it to be. And 
and I've developed some amazing friends and relationships through, through doing that for the last two years. I've been doing it two years. And, but like I said, at, at the point that it becomes, I'm not bringing anything uh, helpful and these things are harming me or even inconveniencing me. And I don't say that in a selfish way. Like I can't be inconvenienced to serve. I'm saying like the service I'm providing is not worth the inconvenience. Um, because obviously like working for church, you get railroaded <laughs> for years and like for decades, you'd like, you know, you're guilted into just like giving up all of your time and energy and focus and serve to this like service. That's ministry. Ministry is like this self-sacrificial thing. Yeah. At this point in my life, I'm just not about that anymore. Like if it becomes an impediment to me making the world better then I'm going to leave it behind. So as far as like, do I find things harmful at a hundred percent? And so you just have to day by day, figure out how those things affect your life, how you like, how I am the one that is bringing those things out or how they come out in my own life in making those changes, obviously raising kids, you have to think about those things every freaking day. Right. Yeah. Uh, And so, and that's not, it's not easy at all. It's not, it's not easy. With the kids, do you deal with the cringe factor of like the, the way that Christians might try to paint the Noah story is like, look kids, this is this great story of the ark and the flood. And you're like, he drowned people, including babies. (laughs) He drowned little old grandmas who just want to, you know, love on their grandkids. He just drowned them. Like what, yeah. how is this story? Good? Do you have that cringe factor when you try to, you know, um, keep yeah. Your... Uh, for one, they may, there may be a Noah's Ark children's book somewhere up there in their bookshelf, but I don't think they know the story of Noah's Ark at all. You know, we, yeah. um, Pete ends was the first one who was just like, how do you teach your kids about these Bible stories? And he was like, you don't, <laughs> you just don't. And, um, you know, I think that's good advice. So, and on a side note, culturally being in a uh, church culture that was so individualistic, individual salvation, individual, uh, you know, like self work and all of those kind of things. The Noah story made no sense to me because it was like this collective, like God is judging the collective when I've only ever been told God judges the individual. And now he's just like, you're telling me every one of these single people was like this murdering rapist. Like that's kind of the, never made any sense to me. Yeah. And later um, I think he says something about, you know, I, I punished to the sixth and seventh generation or something like that. Yeah. Well, no just, I'll just add this. This will be a, for another discussion, but um, the cringe factor is pretty high. It, it's especially augmented in families where one person has deconverted mm-hmm. and one person has not And I, I personally struggle with that a lot. My wife is still very much a, a conservative evangelical oh, wow. literalist Christian. And so, um, you know, we have those books all over the place and it's a, it's a tough journey. And I definitely uh, feel for the, the journey that some people are going through where they have to, where these things that you would say even trigger you almost like that's not what we should be teaching kids. Mm-hmm. It's not, at the church down the street a mile it's 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 like it's four feet away yeah and it, it is very difficult but um anyway i did want to make sure i left some time for you um sure to do a song would now be a good time yeah let's do it what uh what's the name of the song you're gonna sing okay so this is a song called does god and uh so yeah like i said i'm preparing an ep um that's that i started writing in 2016 um right around election time mm-hmm. so uh the first song I wrote for that was a song called recover, which was, um, you know, that was more like my actual letter to the American church. Um, you know, after they elected Donald Trump. And so that one's out, you can see that, uh, on any of my streaming sites. Um, I did want to suggest people go see that. That is, I'll have the link for it beneath our video, but that is a very powerful mu- uh, music video and, and song. Loved what you do there. I've listened to that song uh, at least 10 times, I'm sure. Awesome. It's, it's fantastic. So please well, thank go. You. When when we're done, please, everyone, click over. And, and uh, also, I should add, if I don't, so don't forget later, mm-hmm. please go like and subscribe to, uh, to Clay's channel. I'll have the link for that. So you can go there, like, subscribe, comment, all that. Give him a lot of support for what he's doing because you are doing a great thing. And I hope your platform just expands. So uh, well, thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. And I, I don't know if we said before we were recording, but so I, I go by clay, but my artist name is 
Forest Clay because Kirchenbauer is just way too hard to spell. So yeah, all my music is now found under Forest with two R's, Forest Clay. Awesome. Yep. All right. So yeah, this song um, was the last song I wrote for the EP. And uh, it's a piano ballad with strings. I'm going to play it on guitar here. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. But yeah, this is a song um, that's about all of the questions that uh, we talked about the last two hours. You know, what is God? What does God think? Does God think? And if we let that go, um, what's left? And to me, what is left is the idea and the, the beautiful idea, I think, that we are made in the image of God. Now, that obviously can be deconstructed as well, but um, that we are manifestations of God. And whether or not you believe in God, that you can, I still think you can hold on to the idea that there is something, um, something beautiful in humanity as messed up as we are. Uh, and we are messed up, but there's some, this, there's something beautiful in people from every culture, every corner of the world. And, um, so I, I've spent a lot of time in my life writing love songs to God. And I decided that I would write a love song to humanity. So this song is called does God. <laughs> Thank you, brother, with that intro. That was really, that was great. No problem. Does God have a face? Does he have a body, even a name? If he does, does he know? I'm alive Is God Even here Does she care That I doubt Does she care that I fear Something tells Me God Will survive So take a breath Breathe it in the mystery that is this The universe we don't know But I think the truth is If God has a face His face must look like you Did God kill his kid? Did he have to have blood before he would forget? Or maybe we made a God that looks like us. Does God know my name? Is the ache in my soul just confined to my brain? Even so, does that mean it's not real? So take a breath, breathe it in. The mystery that is this. The universe we don't know. But I think the truth. God has a face, her face must look like yours. A face like a Tina in the Ahmed or Mildred, a Russ and his husband, Gus and their children. A face like a Kim, a Ted or Tyrone. Lucy born with an extra chromosome A Pablo with legs he can't move by himself A girl born a Daniel who now is Daniel A Bill Agent even white guys named Todd 
If you have a heartbeat, you are the face of God. So take a breath. Breathe it in, the mystery that is this, a universe we don't know, but I think the truth is, if God has a face, her face must love, if God has a face, his face must love. If God has a face, that face it must be your. Bravo. I think that's one of the most profound songs I've heard in a long, long time. I, well, thank you. That's awesome. You. you surprised me with some of the words you picked in there. So that's, there's a lot in there to unpack, and I can tell you chose some of your words very, very carefully. That's that's awesome. Yes, I did. Thank you. Well, for anyone that's watching, please uh, go, again, like and subscribe to his channel, but also, if, if you can, please uh, buy his album as soon as it's available. And I did always like to leave just a, a minute at the end to say, is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to, to talk about or any kind of final closing words you wanted to add? Um. No, I we we didn't we didn't talk about um, my experience in a rock band, and that's totally fine. If you go to my Facebook page and that's something that interests you, like a story of a failed rock band on a major record label, um, I wrote two years ago. Or I think I wrote a blog series about the whole experience. It's like a fifteen-part blog series, and the the first one is um, the pinned post on my music page, uh, Facebook.com/slash Forest Clay Music. So you can, if that interests you at all, you can read through that there um awesome. and then uh i'll link that as well beneath the video so people can click awesome. over yeah I don't, I don't have any uh closing words except look at the birds awesome awesome well thank you so much uh clay this has been awesome i really appreciate it i'd love to get to hear more of your story in the future I'd love to follow up with you at some point but thank you for giving us this awesome intro today this is you've given me a lot to think about and i'm hopefully our viewers are feeling the same way so thank you for what you're doing thank you as well for i should add using your talents like you're not just you know, writing words on a page, or, or I, I'm honestly a little bit jealous of your musical skills. I'd love to bring a few of those to the table if I can someday, but they're not there Absolutely. right now. <laughs> but just that, I think music is, you're taking things that people like myself might be able to say in kind of boring ways, and music just takes it right to our heart, to our to our mind, to our emotions, and that's that's just such a, a awesome thing. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Let's do it again sometime. All right. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Clay. Yep, have a good one.